Good morning, everyone. Um, thank you for finding time to attend today's seminar, All About Solar Winds, hosted by InfoSight. My name is Amanda Rego, and I am the Senior Marketing Director at InfoSight, and I'll be hosting this seminar with Vaughn Williams, who is InfoSight Senior Security and GRC Assessor. Today, Vaughn will be reviewing the solar wind supply chain attack with updated events and the steps you can take in order to protect yourself from going through a breach like this. At the end of our presentation, there will be a brief survey for you to fill out, which is always greatly appreciated. Please also feel free to submit all questions or comments into the question box, and we will review them at the end of the presentation. Now I'll turn things over to Vaughn to get us started. Thanks, Amanda, for the introduction, and welcome everyone to today's presentation. Before getting into the supply chain attacks, I'd like to tell you a little bit about InfoSight and myself for those of you who may not be familiar with who we are. As you can see on the slide, InfoSight was founded in 1998 and is headquartered in Miami, Florida. From the data center to the cloud, we architect, secure, and manage IT, OT, and ICS critical networks 24-7, 365. Our U.S.-based SOC leverages a co-managed approach in defending your networks, keeping your system safe and secure. We also partner with multiple cloud providers, allowing us to manage and oversee your cloud implementation and security. Plus, if you're not there yet, we can help you migrate to the cloud, too. We also provide security and security awareness training for all levels of employees up to and, and including the board of directors. As you know, it only takes one click on a link or attachment to potentially result in a breach of your organization. And the last thing I'll mention here is that we also offer a wide array of advisory and assessment services to help ensure that your company is adhering to regulatory and industry best practices to give you that peace of mind that you're doing it right, as well as providing you with the tools to improve your security posture. So if you are interested in learning more about any of our services, just indicate that in the survey at the end. and will also be on screen uh, at the end of the presentation and plus our url is at the bottom uh, right of the presentation so feel free to visit the website and learn about us there so our info site team goes beyond the 26 character alphabet with all of the certifications that we hold a small portion of them are on the screen our team is full of members who thrive on learning and attaining new knowledge and certifications, and you can rest easy knowing that you are working with subject matter experts on every project we are engaged with. Now, with that being said, let me give you a little background on who I am and why I'm here today to present this topic to you. As Amanda mentioned, I'm the Senior Security and GRC Assessor with InfoSight. I've got over 25 years of experience in IT, IT controls and cybersecurity with experience from the technology side, through to the regulatory side. On screen, you can see some of the certs that I hold, but my passion really is helping businesses keep their systems and data secure. I spend a lot of time researching the new tricks and tactics that threat actors like to use and incorporating them into our assessments and our services. Uh, this passion of mine started because of AOL and my first online experience creating a username. Every attempt at creating my own clever name resulted in, sorry, that name is taken. After an hour of trying to come up with a name, I was frustrated. You could say I'm a little stubborn, just don't tell my wife I said that. So being frustrated, I banged on the keyboard, I will get in, and hit enter. I must have missed the eye, and it said, congratulations, we'll get in is available. The very next day in the chat room, I was accused of being a hacker. So thank you, AOL, for kickstarting my security career and allowing me to be here today presenting to you. And with that, we'll jump on in and get started. So unless you've been hiding under a server rack, You've been impacted by, or at least heard about, the solar winds breach and attack, and then the ripple effects that will be felt for years. Chances are, even if you believe you haven't, you actually have been impacted by this due to its far-reaching tentacles into not just your supply chain, but into everything supply chains, products you buy, products your suppliers buy, and even into regulatory audits as government auditors will want to know how you are handling these new risks. Just don't make a mistake and ask them how they are handling them. That conversation might not end well. But our primary goal for this presentation is to give you knowledge about supply chain attacks and enable you to help protect your company. So let's start with what a supply chain is. Every company has a product and service that they sell or provide, such as electricity, banking products, healthcare services, and so on. Uh, we'll use electricity as an example. So in order to provide electricity, a series of steps has to be taken to create and deliver it. 
Some simple steps are the generation, distribution, and billing. Other steps consist of putting together processes, software, devices, or items that actually come from some other company or place that are used in those main steps of generation, distribution, and billing. The sources you use to obtain those items are referred to as your supply chain. In IT and technology, the supply chain is generally hardware and software products. Hardware such as computers, servers, firewalls, control panels, etc. Software such as operating systems, productivity software like Word and Excel, communication software, Outlook, SMS, etc. Uh, OT software, if you're on the OT side of utilities and things of that nature, like surveillance, OSI. If you're in the banking world, you have products from FIS or Jack Henry. Uh, part of your technology supply chain also includes things like USB drives, CDs, and stuff. But we don't want this discussion to be just about where you get your products from. We also want to talk about where your suppliers get their products. So a supply chain attack is an attack against one of your suppliers or your supplier supplier by a malicious threat actor. That actor could have several motives for the attack. They could have a desire to disrupt the supply chain. Anybody familiar with the recent Colonial Pipeline debacle? Well, we'll talk about that in just a few moments. The next reason could be a desire to steal information to get a competitive edge, such as the Night Dragon attack in 2011 where petroleum companies were breached and exploratory geodata and technology data was stolen. Imagine the amount of money at stake for the first company that discovers a new oil deposit. A less glamorous attack that turned into something larger occurred because of dumb luck, when someone clicked on something in an email during a massive phishing campaign. That someone was a supply chain employee for a commercial HVAC vendor. Threat actors stayed in the HVAC, HVAC company for months, learning what they could access and how to monetize it. The HVAC vendor, which is the heating and air conditioning, had remote accesses into a major retailer, which resulted in a major target breach of credit card data from a few years back that I'm sure we're all familiar with. So you want to make sure that you know how your company handles HVAC vendors that might have remote access into your systems as well. And for the topic of this presentation, the reason could be to get into a supplier with the goal of perpetrating further attacks against the customers of that supplier. So there have been some notable IT supply chain attacks and we'll talk about a few that are high profile and a few others that have been occurring within the last 90 days. First one up is the super micro attack. Not to get into politics, but like the White House insurrection, depending on who you talk to, this one may or may not have occurred. The evidence I've seen and read leads me to believe that it did occur. The U.S. government, Amazon, Apple, and a whole slew of other major companies use Supermicro in their supply chains to provide servers for a host of various reasons. For a period of about 10 years, the Chinese government had infiltrated Supermicro's own supply chain in China where the majority of circuit boards are made to implant chips and code on the Supermicro motherboards. These tiny little rice-sized chips establish connections back to China. I'm sure that this has occurred to other vendors as well. The Defense Department supposedly identified this as an issue, but didn't publicize it again supposedly because they wanted to learn how this chip and process worked and to study it. I'm pretty sure that the Department of Defense may have used it to feed inaccurate information back to China as well. And for confirmation as to whether or not this actually occurred, Supermicro is currently in the process of moving their production out of China. So the next example is MEDOC. This attack was a Russian act of war against the Ukrainian government and citizens using MEDOC, a tax preparation software that the Ukrainian government basically requires companies there to use to connect to government tax systems. A Russian group named Sandworm infiltrated MEDOC's corporate systems and placed the now famous malware named NotPetya in a program update file. At tax time, these Ukrainian companies downloaded the malicious update and in short order, their computer started crashing. And because NotPetya had some errors in its code, it didn't stay contained in the Ukraine as planned and started to spread globally. There were news alerts reporting this in the US before it actually started affecting companies here, but most affected companies didn't hear or heed the warnings. 
So you want to look at your company's incident response program and ensure that it has a playbook for this type of attack. So when a news alert comes out, your company can respond and protect itself. So realistically, this was a precursor for the type of attack that occurred to SolarWinds. However, this one had a really destructive purpose, not a sneaky one like the SolarWinds attack. Another attack vector is called dependency confusion. This attack was recently released by a researcher, so it could also be fixed. Programming languages that are used to create software have a way of installing dependencies, which are smaller little programs that the larger one depends on, to run. While the larger software program is being created, the little dependencies are stored in the central, usually online, public repository to make it easier when you have multiple people working on a project. The software being created will pull these dependencies from a, a local location when it cannot find the default public repository. So when an update runs, it looks to the default public location first. When it doesn't find anything there, then it looks to the local location. When the programs have been completed, the default public repositories are generally deactivated, turned off, deleted, and therefore no longer exist. This researcher surmised that he could recreate the online public repository by uploading code to the same public online places previously used by these programs. This was easy to do because these online repositories would use the same address but with a different pointer, such as apple.repository or facebookapp.repository, and so on. So this researcher went out and got some company's permissions to test the, his theory. So he created some scripts inside of the dependencies that he then put on the public repositories. So when a company's software project updated, it would first pull code from his newly created repository, download it, and then the, the script would phone home through the internet to let him know that his theory and test was successful. It was indeed successful. Had he actually been an attacker, he would have had access to more than 35 companies with the vast majority of them being over a thousand plus employees. Can anybody say payday? A few of those companies have actually reported that this dependency design is working as designed and is not a bug. So look for more supply chain issues where this is the attack vector if those companies don't fix that. This next one is a recent news story as of a couple weeks ago. Code Cove is a company whose product is used by over 29,000 companies to test software during its creation stage. Some notable companies that use it are Google, Rapid7, Palo Alto, IBM. Notice all big names. Attackers were actually able to access and compromise Code Cove's Docker creation process. Docker is a virtualization software that creates containers used to keep software and systems separated from one another. This compromised access allowed the attackers to access and export Code Cove's clients' continuous integration environments and DevOps credentials to a third party site under control of the attackers. So this means that the attackers had access to potentially 29,000 plus client software platforms that contain build code for their software products. Some companies that they've announced have been affected include IBM, Twilio, Rapid7. Uh, Rapid7 is a cybersecurity and compliance solution and services company. They make one of the most widely used vulnerability scanning systems in use today. What if a hacker were to introduce malware through their product or modify their product to send vulnerabilities detected to a malicious database? Implications are mind boggling when it comes to these type of attacks. Everybody knows about this attack. There's no information on how this occurred as of yet. It has come out that they paid the ransomware group $5 million in order to restore their systems quicker. A few things to note here. I was originally going to comment on there being more of the story than just musing that there were no manual methods of keeping the gas flowing. Uh, however, last night and just this morning, uh, the news stories are that the attack apparently hit the corporate systems, including accounting and billing, and not the OT side of the pipeline computers and controllers. So the pipeline could have still been pumping and shipping gas throughout the pipeline. However, they shut the pipeline down because the operators didn't know how to bill 
for the fuel being delivered through the pipeline. And the colonial bean counters and execs apparently were more worried about being paid for the fuel than worrying about the effects of shutting down the pipeline. So as we know, people panicked and started hoarding gas, even in areas not affected, such as here in central Florida. That Hummer you see on the screen? Two counties over in Citrus County. They just finished filling up several gas cans in the back of the Hummer when it leaked and caught fire, an unintentional uh, side effect of a supply chain breach. One takeaway, when a crisis hits, please don't panic. Leave some gas and toilet paper for the rest of us. Now let's talk about some ransomware attacks that have been in the news over the last 90 days. The first one, Toshiba, obviously, affects the technology supply chain if they can't produce products. Another one, Brentag, a major worldwide chemical company. 14 billion in revenue, all of their US facilities were affected. There's a technology reseller in Illinois and the name has not been released yet. So if you order any if you order any technology items from Illinois, it's possible that your order might not be coming. There's a utility trailer manufacturer, the largest producer of semi-trailers. 73% of the nation's freight comes through semis. If you can't buy trailers, how is that going to affect your supply chain? Ireland's Health Services is currently a victim of ransomware attacks. Are they actually a supply chain vendor? I would say yes. They keep your supply chain workers healthy. Password State. This is actually an Australian password management program. They were ransomware and a lot of their vault data that even though it was encrypted was stolen and shipped off site. It's only a matter of time before they can figure out how to break that encryption and recover those passwords. And this last one on here is Quanta. They're actually an Apple laptop supplier. They had designs that have been stolen and published by the attackers and the designs are for Apple's upcoming MacBook Pro refresh. Pretty sure China would love to see those but they probably already have. On a side note about ransomware and, sh and cyber insurance, governments have been pushing for companies to not pay cyber insurance, or cyber uh, ransom, sorry. With the extortion of data, companies still pay, in part because their cyber insurance covers it. The new trend is that cyber insurance companies are now refusing to include ransoms as a covered expense, so your insurance companies are gonna stop paying ransoms. One large insurance company, AXA, AXA, they're the, one of the top five insurers in Europe, announced a week ago that it would stop paying ransoms. Guess what? Two days ago, they fell victim uh, to an attack and were ransomware themselves. Uh, I would guess that that's not a random attack. So with no insurance to pay for your ransom, your company can still choose to pay, but insurance won't cover it or the damages involved. So as we've shown, SolarWinds is really not the beginning of supply chain attacks, nor the first attack against the software update process. However, this is the first attack of this complexity and scope to affect so many U.S. companies. So yes, most will consider this attack the first major supply chain attack in the IT world. Just know I'm not here to pick on SolarWinds, not to pick on any vendor or company. My goal is to present this and uh, the analysis of it to see what we can learn from it to help you keep your company safe. Unfortunately for SolarWinds, they've become the face of supply chain attacks. So who is SolarWinds? Unless you're still under that server rack, you know SolarWinds is a global company. You may not know that they have over 320,000 direct customers worldwide. Managed service providers utilize SolarWinds for an additional 450,000 customers of their own. So to put it simply, SolarWinds is huge. They have an annual market revenue of right at a billion dollars. The night before the breach broke, SolarWinds market cap was $7.32 billion. The day after, $4.4 billion. Literally overnight, SolarWinds lost 40% of their value. So if you play the stock market, now might be a good time to buy some SolarWinds stock. At the bottom of that, slide you can see their biggest products chances are your company uses one or more of them it's almost certain that at minimum a company you do business with someone in your supply chain uses them and in particular the affected orion product now why was orion targeted 
The most likely reason is that Orion is a platform used for managing basically the whole network and IT stack of a client organization. Orion itself is installed on over 33,000 sites. Over 18,000 of those Orion client sites downloaded and installed the malicious update before the threat actors removed it from SolarWinds site. Were all 18,000 of those companies hacked? Well, no. Technically, they were open to the hackers, but the malicious actors apparently didn't access all 18,000. By using DNS records and other methods, it appears as though the malicious actors were actually exploiting only a few dozen. The main targets appear to be government agencies and very large corporations like Microsoft. There are some free tools out there that you can use to examine your own company's data for determining if you were affected. In addition, there are a list of companies available online as well if you do a search for them. So enough background talk, let's talk about how this attack actually occurred. Information about this breach is slowed down, and what I'm presenting today is what I've learned as of today, literally, when I finalized this presentation. As with most breaches, we may not know the entire story for months, if ever. I've utilized probably well over 100 sources at this point and spent more time than I care to admit reading and learning about this. So to start with a timeline on when things occurred. SolarWinds says that the earliest suspicious activity detected was September 4th, 2019. Catch the phrase, earliest suspicious activity detected. You can translate that to non-suspicious activity may have occurred earlier than that. So no, the original unauthorized access time and date has not been determined as of yet. On September 12th of 2019, test code was injected and a trial run started to see if this process worked without being detected. Two months later, the test ended, obviously. We now know it was successful and the threat actors had evaded detection. On February 20th of 2020, malware was injected into an Orion update and deployed on their update server. Over 18,000 Orion installs downloaded the maliciously modified update opening that door for infiltrations. Since the threat, uh, since the attack was successful, the threat actors then removed the malicious update on June 4th of 2020. Why would they remove it? Most say that it would be because they successfully deployed it on their primary targets and didn't see a need to keep pushing the update out. In addition, I'm sure that the malicious actors weren't expecting or may not have been ready for over 18,000 systems to come back and say, hey, I'm ready for you to hack me. Uh, they were probably overwhelmed. It could also be that the threat actors determined their lowest risk of getting caught was to remove the malicious update. So SolarWinds was notified by third parties on December 12th that their systems had been compromised and that the malware Sunburst was on their systems. Two days of scrambling later, SolarWinds filed an 8K with the SEC and notified shareholders and customers of the attack. Two additional days later, US CERT released their advisory to take all affected systems offline and to restore them with a copy of original firmware and a rebuild of the affected systems. The recommendation was not to use backups as those could have become compromised as well. Estimates are that some entities affected systems won't be brought online for several months. So the investigation is still ongoing and additional news stories about additional vulnerabilities uh, showing some more detections and patches by SolarWinds, uh, China's involvement with other SolarWinds attacks and the Sun Shuttle code that was tied to the main attack after the fact. And just this week, the RSA conference is occurring, and we should hear more details from the new SolarWinds president as he was part of the keynote address yesterday. Unfortunately, I was not able to attend, and I've not seen an update in the last 12 hours or so. So look forward in the security news over the next few days, any update information that this president releases. So now that we know what happened, let's discuss how it happened. Microsoft, one of the many companies affected by this attack, believes activity in the SolarWinds network started through compromised user accounts as early as March 2019. We'll discuss how they determined this when we talk about how it was detected. A company named JetBrains, a SolarWinds supply chain product itself, is rumored to have been compromised and used to attack SolarWinds. It's been denied by JetBrains, but that denial may not accurately reflect JetBrains' involvement. TeamCity, is the JetBrains product utilized by SolarWinds as a continuous integration, continuous development server, hence the suspicion that this product could have been involved in the breach. 
The NSA has also possibly reported connections to actively exploited VMware vulnerabilities where the VMware issues allow malicious attackers to access protected data and abuse what's known as federated authentication, otherwise known as single sign-on. This is used when you log into a website that then uses your computer login to give you access or your corporate login to give you access rather than making you enter an entirely new different username and password. In 2019, FireEye, obviously most of you know that this is a huge cybersecurity company, they were also affected by the SolarWinds attack. Uh, they'd released tools to demonstrate how attackers could get into systems using certain methods that we'll discuss momentarily. The FireEye release was intended to spur fixes for the issues before threat actors could take advantage of it. Hmm. Maybe they were a little too late, or maybe they gave the hackers a how-to and how to create their attack. So once access is gained by the threat actor through whatever vector they use, various methods and abuse of vulnerabilities allow the threat actor to perform what's called privilege escalation to gain admin rights to networks and systems. Once admin rights are granted, the threat actor can pivot to stealing and using forged or stolen OAuth tokens, and those tokens are what makes that single sign-on work that we were just discussing. In most systems, the use of these stolen or forged OAuth tokens allow for bypassing, bypassing multi-factor authentication. For the sake of finishing this presentation on time, we won't discuss how these tokens and that bypass actually works. Once escalated privileges are attained, the threat actor would have been able to access many different internal solo and resources. Once the threat actor was ready to go, they installed malware named Sunspot on a development server, which is used to create the Orion program along with its updates. Sunspot is designed to monitor the commands used on that server that are used to assemble the smaller parts of the code into larger software packages. When the threat actors were ready, they placed the malicious files for Sunspot to add into the update when the next build command was run. Sunspot's programming was designed to notice the build command, back up the source files, replace them with the malicious files in the threat actors repository, and then build the malicious update. When completed, Sunspot would remove the malicious files, replace them with the backed up original files. The intent here would be to evade detection during the next programming cycle. The threat actors would probably still be in SolarWinds systems, if not for the diligence of a few other companies who detected intruders in their own systems. We'll start with FireEye. FireEye announced on December 8th that they had suffered a breach and that red team tools were stolen. These red team tools allow for penetration testing of targeted systems from a hacker's perspective. FireEye learned of their internal breach through monitoring their multi-factor authentication alerts. The alerts that allowed them to detect the breach were classified as zero level, zero level alerts, basically information only alerts that most companies will never look at. However, one FireEye employee took note that an informational notification indicated a cell phone being registered for multi-factor authentication to an employee that already had a cell phone registered for MFA. That usually doesn't happen. This raised his suspicions enough for him to call the employee and ask him about it. The second employee had no knowledge of the second device, and after some FireEye detective work, they determined that compromised account credentials uh, were in play. So FireEye did a review of all of their systems and over 50,000 lines of computer code for the software that they used, and they determined that the cause of their breach was SolarWinds. At the same time that this was occurring, Microsoft was actually conducting their own investigation. So Microsoft has internal settings limiting their authentication token life to just one hour. Microsoft's internal systems flag tokens that were used past their expiration time. Microsoft systems also flag tokens and certificates that were assigned to Office 365 accounts that already had tokens and certificates assigned to them. Impossible logins were also detected. These are also known as impossible travel logins. It's not uncommon for accounts like Netflix and Facebook to allow multiple logins using the same credentials. I'm sure some of you share your Netflix account. Most companies do not look for the physical distance between login sessions. Fewer still disallow it. It's good corporate account policy to at least limit corporate accounts to concurrent logins within the same facility. 
So Microsoft's alerting detected that the physical distance between login sites made it impossible for the same person to have been responsible for both logins. So Microsoft put two plus two plus two together and it equaled SolarWinds. Now we know how SolarWinds was hacked, how two companies detected it. Let's talk about who was behind it. Unless the culprit actually comes out and admits it, there's no definitive proof of who was behind it. With that being said, all of the indicators that have been found all point to one Russian-based group, APT29, also known as Cozy Bear and a, lot of, and a lot of other names. Whether they are part of the government, work for the government, or just forced labor is yet to be determined. Some of their most well-known activities include the Pentagon email attack of 2015. You might also remember the DNC email issue that plagued the beginning of Trump's presidency. Yep, APT29. In 2020, last year, it was revealed that COVID-19 research and vaccination data was targeted and successfully exfiltrated. Also recently in the news is that the French government's announcement of a supply chain attack targeting internet service providers. And then of course you have SolarWinds. One of the primary ways that researchers tie attacks to certain groups is through the methods utilized. Certain groups like to use tried and true methods that they're experts at. In addition, the code that they use contains little snippets that can be tied to them. For APT29, we'll talk about their primary weapons, which are very effective. That method's targeting credentials through spear phishing attacks. Threat actors don't have the burden of hurrying up and getting the job done like the rest of us working people do. They have months and years to learn about who they want to target and what tactics are likely to work. While spear phishing is Cozy's weapon of choice, they will also attempt to compromise credentials through password spraying techniques. If you're not familiar with that term, that's where they will utilize a list of common or breached passwords against a targeted username. In addition, they will try brute forcing passwords, which works for simple passwords. On a side note, most password management systems have the ability to tell you if the same password you use was also used by someone that has been breached in the past. I'd recommend you guys using your uh, software feature to check that password out. So if we know who it is, why hasn't the US government shut them down? That's a legit question. The answer, how do we know they haven't? There's a war going on that we don't see or know about. They're hacking us, we're hacking them. Government interactions are going on that we will never be privy to. If one person or group gets taken down, it's the next man up. There's never going to be a shortage of up and coming hackers. It's always going to be a back and forth battle. Uh, also in the news the last couple of weeks is that sanctions have indeed been announced that literally will have little to no impact. It's more for show than go. So all of this information is fine and dandy, but how could SolarWinds have protected themselves from the threat actors? The simple answer is, through their IT stack and their governance risk and compliance stack. So overview and insider risk and password policies. SolarWinds should start here. In some circles, SolarWinds has had the reputation and history of lax security standards. For more than 18 months, you could find a developer's FTP username and password on a GitHub public repository. Just two months ago, testifying before a House Oversight and Homeland Security Committee, the now former, as it should be, SolarWinds CEO reported that an intern was responsible for violating password policies and using and posting the insecure password of SolarWinds, all lowercase, one, two, three. How can an intern violate password policies to create a simple password? Did they not have controls in place to enforce password complexity? Granted, not many security controls can keep an intern from publicizing a password. However, if password complexity is not enforced, how much easier is it to conduct an attack? With an unenforced password policy, there were likely hundreds of violations throughout SolarWinds' entire organization. Remember how Cozy likes to attack? Phishing, spraying, brute forcing, SolarWinds made it easy for them. If you have a policy, ensure you have controls in place to enforce it. Additional controls should be utilized to verify it. No company should be getting hacked today because they have an easy password. It's completely unacceptable for a company with an annual revenue of a billion dollars. Hopefully your company doesn't sacrifice security to achieve business goals. So start with the top, work your way down through the risk, and ensure you have your bases covered. 
security awareness training. Obviously, if fishing were the primary reason for the success of the SolarWinds attack, security awareness training might have helped to prevent it. Vulnerability and penetration testing might have uncovered open ports and unpatched systems before they were discovered by the attackers. Utilizing a patching program and regularly applying patches and updates to system and software to alleviate some of those vulnerabilities could have also prevented the attack. Next generation firewalls and gateway AV might have shown activity and alerts from unusual locations or heuristics might have revealed unusual code. Multi-factor authentication for all users. In the recent past few years, multi-factor has been pushed for privileged accounts. However, because of privilege escalation and how easy that is, you should enable multi-factor authentication for all users. Had it been in play here, they might not have been able to access the company to begin with, even with an easy password. SIM, security and information event management systems. When you have a system that can correlate a new cell phone being added with access being granted from a new location like another country, it allows attacks and indicators of compromise to be detected and thwarted before they become a problem. A big part of SIM is sharing information on any potential or active threats found with other entities such as FSISAC or MSISAC. And if you don't have a SIM, your company should at least be putting eyes on your security alerts and systems. Note here that this is what FireEye did that allowed them to catch their breach. SOC, Security Operations Center. What might you catch in real time if you used a security operations center and had eyes on glass 24-7, 365? A lot more than you would by only reviewing your critical and high alerts. Segmentation of the network could have been used to keep threat actors from traveling between sensitive systems. Using this, you can stymie an attack or at least prolong it enough to catch it. Those of you who are in PCI DSS know that you can utilize this technique to keep non-essential systems out of scope of your PCI DSS reviews. And the last item on this list, if there was a final review of the compiled update after the build, but before it was released, it might have been caught as well. Any one of these or a combination of a few of them may have prevented this and allowed SolarWinds to catch it. A few extra notes here on SolarWinds. Not, on, not only do they have a new president, they've also hired three new executives, including a CISO. And a side note for that, the CISO was actually promoted from within. Uh, I'm not gonna discuss that. One thing shocking to me though, is that so far 87% of SolarWinds customer base has been renewing their contracts with the government sector, actually increasing their SolarWinds licensing. However, I am a firm believer that when a company gets hacked like SolarWinds did, they will probably be one of the safest companies to work with at least for a few years due to the increased scrutiny that they will see. So we know some steps that SolarWinds could have taken to prevent or at least detect the breach, but what about you and your organization? What do you need to do after this presentation? Your team should have already addressed this, but I'll cover it anyways to make sure that you do know. You need to determine if your company has SolarWinds Orion. If you do, I recommend that you seek third-party assistance to determine if and how you might have been impacted. As a matter of fact, CISA, the, the government agency, just released on the 14th, which is just a couple days ago, eviction guidance for networks affected by the SolarWinds and Active Directory Microsoft 365 compromise. It's really a good read to help companies make sure that they eliminate this issue from their systems. Rather than throwing the link on the screen, all you have to do is just Google CISA eviction guidance. It'll show up as your first result. In addition, you need to determine if any of your vendors, your supply chain utilizes Orion. If they do, you will also need to protect yourself. You want to find out if the vendor has remote access into your system, figure out what controls you have in place for that. Does your system receive updates from a vendor? Look at your company's patching policy to determine if updates are applied automatically or go through a vetting process to determine any issues before it becomes an issue. Find out if your vendor stores or has access to any of your confidential or customer data. 
then you want to look at their access to your data and verify with them what they do and have done to secure your data. Don't be shy. It's your data. Once you've gone through the process of verifying, if you or your vendors have Orion, you will want to pivot to your Office 365 security. Go to your Office 365 security and compliance center settings and logs and review them for indicators of compromise. Are there any suspicious logins outside of normal times or locations while in there? Ensure that you have rules and notifications set up for those type of things. CISA, what I was just referencing, the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency released a tool called Sparrow to help you determine if any of your Microsoft accounts or apps have been compromised. Search for that, download it, and use it. There are also third parties you can bring in to run tools that'll check for security. And you can also look at your internet filtering logs and search for AVS VM Cloud or RayWeb.com from the beginning of 2020 through today, as those are domains used by the threat actors to carry out their attack. We've talked about what you should do today, but what should you do going forward? You must understand there's no single solution that can be employed to stop these kinds of attacks. It's a multi-layered approach and that requires the entire organization to be involved, starting with senior management and the board. It's cliche, but it's true. Your company should maintain a top-down, all hands on deck mentality. Now's the time to start planting more security seeds. If the soil is hard, such as when things are not affecting your company, the seed may not grow. When things like this SolarWinds hack occurs, it tills up that security soil and upper management and allows seeds to be planted that germinate and sprout that might not otherwise grow. Also, use this as an opportunity to have those security conversations that have fallen flat in the past. Have frank conversations about your risk and your company's ability to protect itself. There's no time to get things done like when management's ready to spend to protect themselves. We don't like to use fear, but sometimes it is a great motivator. And the last item with senior management and the board, have the mindset that you have to prove that you are safe. Don't assume you are because you have everything in place. You need to test and verify that everything's working as it's intended. Social engineering test, pen test, web app testing, and more can provide proof that you are safe. Going forward, ensure that your organization has or will implement a security framework such as NIST CSF, National Institute of Standards and Technology Cybersecurity Framework. In implementing security controls, you should determine their current maturity levels. In other words, how good they are today for each of the controls. Then management has to decide what the desired maturity levels are how good they want them to be. And then you have to develop a plan of actions and milestones to ensure progress is being made towards making them better. And everybody has to understand it's an ongoing endeavor. Hackers change and get better. Your company should too. In addition, you should have an unbiased second set of eyes review your security practices. It is the job of cybersecurity professionals such as myself to help protect the clients by performing a gap analysis or other service such as vulnerability testing and penetration testing services. Penetration testing actually shows you if a threat actor can abuse the discovered vulnerabilities to get into your system. Now we want to carry that a little farther, not just into your systems, but your vendor systems. Good old vendor management. What does your company do to vet its potential vendors? What qualifications are the vendors required to have? You want to look at your vendors and assess the risk to your systems if they are breached. You want to review the vendor security controls. Don't be shy. Again, it's your company's security on the line. Ask for their SSAE 16s, their 18 SOC reports, policies, programs. Ask them for information related to their vendor management program and how they manage your fourth party risk. They should be as diligent with their third parties as you are with your third parties. What does your vendor do for their BCP and DR program? Is it as robust as yours? Right now, like literally, like this very second, the strongest typhoon ever to hit the west coast of India is disrupting and affecting a lot of businesses right now that have third party ties to India. Look at what regulatory requirements the vendor may have to comply with. Become familiar with those requirements yourself. Contractual review. You want to ensure that your contract with a vendor covers requirements and stipulations to notify you when they have a breach. Some companies like to just stick it in an 8K SEC filing that few people ever review and consider that notification. 
What insurance coverages does the vendor carry to cover cyber events? What security requirements are stipulated in your contract, as well as what service level agreements must be met? Does their carrier cover ransoms? Ascertain where you rank on the vendor's list of clients. Will they work with you first or last? That also affects where you rank in their BCP DR discussions. This should all be spelled out. And lastly, you can require your vendors to get their products from reputable sources and not from third party hand shops, buying refurbs, etc. And finally, what is good for the goose is also good for the gander. What you expect from your supply chain from your vendors will help you protect yourself. You should note as I go through these, the list on this slide is the same from the earlier slide, but I've rearranged the order. Once you determine if your company is using SolarWinds or a supplier is using SolarWinds, it is important to understand going forward that you should prioritize items internally that will protect you from future supply chain attacks. Remember, no single solution exists. Multi-layered approach. First recommendation is to have a vulnerability testing conducted in and against your environment, OT and IT. This will allow you to close and remedy any known vulnerabilities in your systems that could be exploited today. At minimum, this testing should occur yearly and whenever you have major system changes. Patching and applying updates is a must, not just OSs, all your software, Java, Adobe, VLC, etc. Lock down all your credentials with MFA. Every user, any system that supports it, lock it down. Follow that up with using a high quality next gen firewall with gateway AV and, and controls built in. Segment your network so if someone does get in, they can only access a part of your network and not your entire network. Go through your GRC stack of controls, training, policies, risk assessments. Can impress upon you the importance of having a cybersecurity gap analysis conducted to help you ensure that your controls meet industry standards and can't be bypassed by a password of Electric 123. And finally, if you can, follow up with the rest. SIM, eyes on glass, review of alerts. You have to understand it's not possible to prevent your company from being attacked. An attacker will attack. But do you know how to survive a bear attack when you and your buddy are out in the woods? When a bear starts to charge you, run faster than your buddy. The same applies to protecting yourself. Let the hackers have the easy prey while you make it harder to get into your systems. Everything being equal, attackers will go after the easiest targets first. Do what you can to protect yourselves, short of tripping your buddy so that the bear eats him first. One interesting thing that you can do to keep yourself safe from ransomware, uh, well, at least the Russian versions, it seems that the Russian versions have code in them that skips installing the ransomware on computers that have virtual Russian keyboards. If it finds one, it aborts. So you can technically install a Russian virtual keyboard and it will protect you from a lot of the Russian ransomware. So let's go over a few takeaways. Every company has a supply chain and attack could happen to anyone. You don't have to be a government entity or a company that works to provide services to a government to be targeted. Your company is responsible for your company's security. Don't rely on your suppliers. SolarWinds could have prevented it. At minimum, they should have detected it. Today, you need to determine if your company has been affected by the SolarWinds breach. Your company can take steps to protect itself today. Remember that there is no single solution and that you need to work with management to ensure an all hands on deck approach from the top down. Utilize a third party review for a fresh set of eyes on your security posture. Implement a SOC with eyes on glass. Vendor management is important and fourth party vendor management is just as important. And lastly, don't be afraid to challenge your providers on providing documentation. So now at this point, I'm going to turn it back over to Amanda to go over some Q&A. So Amanda, it's all yours. Uh, thank you so much, Vaughn. We did get a few questions that rolled in throughout the presentation. So to start us off, someone asked if phishing and passwords are the primary ways that these hackers get into systems, why do you recommend vulnerability testing first? Ooh, that's a great question. Um, a vulnerability test can allow you to see and close any openings that exist today. 
the hackers could already be using to get into your systems. In addition, if you have the right person or company doing the right test, they will also scan your domain for password policies and consistency as well, thereby covering the vast majority of your bases and not just the few password bases. So they should actually be able to tell you if you have any short, easy passwords in use when they do the vulnerability testing. Great. And then the other question that we got was, how can we find out if hackers are in our systems today? Ooh, that's another good question. The primary way would be for you to look for indicators of compromise known as IOCs. That could be anything that's not the norm from strange file names to additional services running. Uh, another example would be reports of emails being received from your staff that they did not send. Uh, even impossible logins like we talked about during the Microsoft review. Uh, my recommendation would be for you to speak with your primary security team member and ask them how they look for IOCs. Also, if you haven't already done so, uh, talk to them and also seek guidance from a qualified third-party person to come in and look for IOCs in your environment. There are companies and people with special uh, certifications that can look for IOCs for you. Awesome. Thank you so much, Vaughn. Um, that concludes our Q&A and wraps up our seminar. We hope that you enjoyed this seminar and learned something new. We will be sending a follow-up email with resources, so be on the look, look out for that. And if you have any questions, please feel free to contact Vaughn using the contact information provided on the screen or by responding to our follow-up email once you receive it. As stated before, our post-show survey will pop up immediately once I end the webinar. We really appreciate all of your feedback, and we will see you next time. Thank you.